please open in your Bibles to Psalm 93. Psalm 93, we're continuing our series, A Summer in the Psalms, and we find ourselves in Psalm 93. This is my third message from this series, and all of the psalms that I've chosen for my contribution are taken from what's identified as book four of the Psalms. So if you can think of a hymnal, those of you familiar with traditional church settings where they have a hymnal at the pew or in the rack behind the chair, this would be like the fourth mini hymnal within the hymnal, fourth book within the hymnal. And in this Psalm, brief as it is, five verses, the psalmist, who is anonymous, no attribution is given, is focusing his reader's attention and ours on the reality of the Lord's reign in order to sustain our hope and create peace in our hearts regardless of our circumstances. Psalm 93, this is God's word. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Verse five, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this psalm, and we pray now that you would help each of us, both here in the sanctuary, as well as those who are watching this via stream online. You would help each of us, Lord, to focus our attention on you as revealed in these words, these inspired words. Lord, we thank you that your word through the work and agency of your Holy Spirit is able to reveal and bring fresh hope and even, Lord, produce peace through the revelation of the one described here. And so we pray, Spirit of God, help us to do more than simply read the words on a page and consider for a moment their meaning. As important as that is, Lord, we pray Open our hearts to receive you, the one of whom it is said, the Lord reigns. Though the waters they roar, your decrees, Lord, are trustworthy. And therein lies our hope as believers. Help us, Lord, we pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Hope in a perfect storm, hope in a perfect storm. That's the title for this morning's message. And as you just read, and as we'll take time to consider, there's a lot about storms in this brief psalm. There's a lot about storms in this psalm. And there's a lot about storms because storms and waves as they're described here have the ability to weaken and unsettle 
our confidence in the Lord and his presence and his promises to us. Let me, by way of an illustration, introduce this psalm by reminding you of something many of you experienced. I did not. I did not live here at the time. But this Halloween, 30 years ago, was the perfect storm. The storm that was depicted uh, in the year 2000 by that not Oscar-nominated movie starring George Clooney of that weather event in the Atlantic where three different weather systems came together and formed what meteorologists called a perfect storm. Winds were documented uh, on the ocean there out in the North Atlantic, uh, something about 100 miles or more. Uh, and wave heights rose from their normal levels to, in some cases, they're predicting based on the meteorological instruments they had in the water and in the sky, something they called rogue waves, waves that may have risen to the heights of 100 to 300 feet. Those are big waves. Those are waves that topple those large cargo ships, mayor's cargo ships, as well as cost the lives of the 10 fishermen on the Andrea Gay who were sword fishing there out in the North Atlantic and were unfortunately killed by the perfect storm. I was on the Boston Globe this week and they were, they had an article that looked back on the perfect storm and they had pictures there, you could look it up, on the impact of this storm on the coast there of Massachusetts. And the pictures show what you would expect is massive waves pounding the coast and the properties that were there on the shoreline not only being flooded, but completely lifted off of their foundation and destroyed. Two people who commented wrote the following, South Shore Rick, I'm sure he's surprised to be mentioned in a sermon. My wife and I certainly won't forget the perfect storm. We had just moved from Malden to Brant Rock, which is in Plymouth County. Our house on Ocean Avenue, on the ocean side of the street, I can still hear the cable news guy saying, we haven't had a really bad storm here in 70 years. I was working at the old Bay Bank's IT department in Waltham. In the telecom building, I got a call from my wife saying I'd better leave and get home as soon as possible. When I finally did get through the National Roadblock on National Guard Roadblock on 139, it was quite a devastating sight. Water up to my windows in my Azuzu Trooper, and the house we'd only spent one day in was completely knocked off its foundation. Junie writes, I too remember the perfect storm. I was living in Winthrop, right down the street from Winthrop Shore Drive. Many times in the past during storms, I would go up on the seawall and take pictures of waves crashing. This time, no way. The water filled my basement of my grandmother's house. We lost power for over a week. When the water receded, there were rocks and dead fish all the way up to the second floor. It was really quite a storm, the perfect storm. Well, Psalm 93 is a psalm given to God for his people that experience storms as well. Perhaps not the perfect storm of 30 years ago, but storms where the effect of their impact creates tumult and trouble and turmoils in our lives. Perhaps for most of us, the last year or so has felt like a storm of sorts. It meets the requirements of a storm. And as it continued, it felt like there were other storms that followed the first storm, one storm after another. And when you've lived through 
storms and you begin to hear news or updates of potential future storms, it can have the ominous feeling that leads to despair. Psalm 93 was written to people like you and I to remind us of God's sovereign rule over all when we are tempted to despair because we either find ourselves in the midst of a serious storm or perhaps in our personal lives, it is storm-like. Derek Kidner in his commentary on Psalm 93 writes this, Psalm 93 confronts us with a fact whose impact upon us may have weakened. Psalm 93 confronts us with a fact whose impact upon us may have weakened. That fact is this, the Lord reigns, but the continual experience of storms may have weakened the impact of God's sovereign reign and rule over our souls. So this psalm, in an expression of God's mercy and fatherly care to us, is meant to steady our soul and strengthen our hearts with a biblical fact In the midst of the storm, even a perfect storm, the Lord reigns. Here's my main point. The reality of God's reign revealed in Psalm 93 is able to sustain our hope and create peace in our hearts regardless of our circumstances. Doesn't that sound wonderful? The reality of God's reign revealed in Psalm 93 is able to sustain our hearts and create peace in our hearts regardless of our circumstances. So we'll look at three themes here, if you will, as we consider that emphasis. The Lord reigns, he is mighty, the floods roar, and the decrees of God are trustworthy. Let's look at the first theme in verses one through two, the Lord reigns. And as we do, I want you to consider this question. When you think about the Lord in the midst of your storms, which do you tend to focus on and emphasize more? His personal care or his transcendence. Which do you tend to focus on and emphasize more? May Psalm 93 stir our trust to focus on both. Verse 1 and 2, the Lord reigns. Verse 1 and 2, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on his strength as a belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The Lord reigns. The theme of Psalm 93, helpfully, is introduced in the first verse. The Lord reigns. The psalmist begins by announcing to Israel clearly and concisely the one who reigns over all, the Lord. You know me, when I see repetition in a psalm, I don't don't know Hebrew poetry, but I know the repetition's there for a reason, so that the intent of the psalm gains my attention. And we see in this psalm that the Lord, in capital letters, is repeated five times. Five times. Five references in just five verses to the Lord. And if you look down at your Bibles, you'll see those letters are capitalized. 
So the Lord is the one who reigns over all. The Lord, whose personal name was graciously revealed to Moses at the burning bush and again at the cleft of the rock in Exodus 34. The Lord is the one who reigns over all. The great I am. The sovereign one, the self-existent one, symbolized in the burning bush that wasn't consumed, but just burned and burned and burned. The self-sustaining one. He, the psalmist tells us, is the one who cares for his people. He is the one who has promised to protect his people. And he is the self-staining one who will never change. His name, the Lord, in capital letters, reveals not only what he is like, but how he acts in response to Israel's idolatry and sin, but also their circumstances and their storms. He is the Lord who graciously intervenes. He is the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. This God is the their God. Our God is the their God. He's here with us. And he reveals his personal name and his redemptive acts to demonstrate that. And then the psalmist shifts our attention in the second part of verse 1 to the Lord's wardrobe. It says the Lord is robed in majesty. Do you see that? The Lord is dressed in majesty. So fundamental to God's character and nature is majesty that he's pictured here as being clothed in it. J.I. Packer writes, God is not limited. He is eternal. He is almighty. He is infinite. He has us in his hands. We never have him in ours. Like us, he is personal. But unlike us, he is majestic. The Lord is robed in majesty. He has put on his strength as a belt. And as if to emphasize that, He then says at the beginning, at the end of verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. So the Lord who is clothed in majesty is described here as one upon whom the stability of the world is guaranteed by the stability of God's throne. The one who occupies the throne in your life and mine and in our world is from everlasting to everlasting and the world is securely in his hands. He is from everlasting and his throne is established from everlasting, and the world which he has created is firmly and securely in his hands. Now, I think for most of us, because I'm preaching to the choir, you've got this. We've got this. Not perfectly, maybe Maybe, maybe like what Kidner described, it's weakened, but somewhere in our theology, we do believe God is infinite, God is transcendent, God is big. And the world is in his hands. But then we get to verse three and four. The waves, the storms. And they start roaring. Those waves start crashing. They start pounding. And a gap begins to emerge between that beautiful song, Jim, you led us to sing, You Are God Alone. And my trust and the peace I feel 
when I see the storm on the horizon. I'm with you in that. I see the gaps forming already in my heart as I think about the fall and winter and spring. I know the first two verses are true, but then how do I explain the nervous anxiety that's starting to creep in? Or the fears that seem to not turn off when I go to bed at night? And I'm not even talking about the news. I'm just talking about whatever my mind decides to fixate on that feels storm-like. There's nothing like going on vacation with family when you're going on vacation. To go on vacation to introduce you to maybe not perfect storms, but some unsettling rip currents. A comment made here, an expectation expressed or unmet, old histories reviewed and revisited that that's not how it happened, really. I was much nicer than that. And where you love your family, those moments have an unsettling, dawning, illuminating effect where, boy, my peace of mind is not so much dependent on the Lord reigns, but just that my family would say better things to me. And that's just vacation for Bauer. And then there's work for you or relationships that you're, or past that somehow is being brought up and rehearsed or, or the future that seems uncertain or clear or medical concerns that seem to lurk on the horizon or unfinished business from the past. And we say with the psalmist, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. What did the boss say? That could impact my security. The floods have lifted up their voice. The psalmist can hear them. They're roaring. The floods lift up their roaring. I just bought a house and I've got water in my basement. I'm making this up. And I'm standing in it. And it's threatening what I'm now invested in. So use the house as an analogy. Maybe you didn't just buy a house, but we, we put our effort and life and energy into something that we thought was secure. And then the raves roar and all of a sudden we're standing in water and the investment seems at risk and vulnerable. That's what he's describing. Mightier than the thunders of the many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, verse four, the Lord on high is mighty. Yes, but listen, what it feels like, right, when you experience a storm, and there are many different kinds of storms that we experience, and the ambiguity of the psalmist seems to be intentional. He doesn't tell us what storm he's referring to in the life of the nation or even in his personal responsibilities or roles there in the kingdom. He feels threatened by the waves and the roar because he realizes these threats are real. These rising waters could inflict great damage. These storms could be catastrophic. When my sister, who grew up in Pennsylvania, there in the western suburbs, moved to the San Francisco area, her husband, my brother-in-law, was a research physician at, at one of the hospitals there in San Francisco. They experienced for the first time what we never experienced in Philadelphia. We experienced many things in Philadelphia, which New Englanders look at probably sheepishly and say, really? Does that really get you upset? But we wouldn't have a category for this. You know what she experienced? They just bought their house. They experienced an earthquake. 
fire hydrants pop, dishes start falling from the wall. They did know well enough to run outside, but when that ground starts moving, and you can also hear, apparently there's a sound that an earthquake makes like before or after. She said she'll never forget that sound. Now, I wouldn't be able to hear it. I can't hear anything. But it freaked her out, understandably. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't the earthquake that caused candlestick bark to, you know, like collapse and the bridge to fall. But it was an earthquake. When the ground beneath you shakes, when you're not assuming that's at risk, it makes you afraid. I remember after I saw the movie The Perfect Storm. I know this is silly, but it happened also when I watched the movie Jaws. And we're down at the shore. We're two blocks from the ocean. But I remember going to bed after seeing the perfect storm and thinking, if while I'm asleep, one of these rogue waves shows up, you know, a 300-footer and pounds the beach, we're schnitzeled. <laughs> we're gone. And it, it was messing with me. I, I, you know, I don't know why. I mean, it's a movie. It's, it's Mark Wahlberg. It's a movie. But it was a reminder that there are things in my world that I don't control. And that when I don't control them and they appear to be a threat to me, verses one and two don't seem quite as literal to me. Verses one and two are not in that moment something I'm defending for orthodoxy. Of course, it's true. But then why explain all the unrest and uneasiness and anxiety? This is where this psalm, in God's precious care for us, reaches down and offers better news than the floods and their roaringness say to us, because the Lord, verse 4, is mightier than the thunders, because the Lord, verse 4, is mightier than the waves of the sea, because the Lord on high is mighty, all the forces of chaos and evil that could threaten the people of God ultimately do so in vain because God's people are protected by him. God's people are sustained by him. God's people are dearly loved by him. And so when the floods lift up their voice, and it doesn't look promising at the ground level, verse 4 assures the people of God that they shall not be overwhelmed. They shall not go under. Why? Because the Lord on high is mighty. And just when we might anticipate at the conclusion of the psalm, a concluding declaration one more time, the Lord reigns. Instead, the psalm ends on a very comforting note, a sweet personal note that invites the reader, you and I, to draw near to God in order to bolster our confidence and trust in him and find in him the peace we need when storms threaten us. Verse five, my final point, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The Lord's rule, final point, and his presence are accessible through his word. The Lord reigns, the storms and their waves are real, but the Lord's rule and his presence are accessible through his word. Verse five announces that This God who is clothed with majesty and strength draws near to his people. Do you see that in verse 5? It says, his decrees are trustworthy. 
holiness befits his house. You know, you know your Bible. In children's ministry, we talk about this, and in church here, that God chose to dwell in the midst of his people. He chose to have a house that he could dwell in, symbolized certainly by the tabernacle, constructed by Solomon as the temple. God has always chosen to be near his people, to dwell in the midst of his people. And he has stunningly promised to dwell in their midst so that we can hear him speak to us, verse 5, through his decrees which are always trustworthy. The majestic and mighty God speaks to his people through his decrees and it says holiness befits his house. So for the psalmist, God's presence is manifest to God's people through his word in his house that they can say with him, oh Lord, you are forevermore. Not just in this life, The word forevermore indicates that the psalmist, inspired by the Spirit, looks into eternity and adds forevermore. God's decrees will not be trustworthy in this life. His presence will not only befit his house, he'll be present, but, oh, Lord, for your people, for the believer, that will be true forevermore. And so as the psalmist concludes his psalm, He invites us in the midst of the storm to sing this psalm in the face of the difficulties we are facing and to do so by bringing into our worship the decrees of God which are trustworthy and the promise of his presence which is always true. What what is the scariest catastrophe, personal or otherwise, you've ever faced? Think about that for a moment. What is the scariest catastrophe we have faced? Now, when we say catastrophes, we think of earthquakes or floods or hurricanes or but it can, be, it can be certainly large and epic like that, but it can also be very personal and uh, very poignant. The loss of a job suddenly to throwing your financial security or the diagnosis by a doctor that you're sick. The pastor who married us who has walked closely with Jesus for all of his life and we still watch the video. Remember when we had videos of his just sweet benediction as he prayed for us? He's walking with Jesus, served faithfully, Covenant Fellowship Church for friends on Facebook. We were notified. He has an inoperable, uncurable, rare disease. And he's got less than nine months to live. And Alan would say, Don't weep with me. Rejoice with me. Jesus is near. And I'm now getting much closer to seeing him. That's a catastrophe for Linda, his wife, and his kids. And I'm sure it's harder than what his Facebook update is indicating, although he is a faith-filled man that I've observed now for 30 years. But I'm sure the news when his doctor gave it to him and then reiterated to Linda had the effect of a storm and waters are rising. Imagine if Alan had put into his hope chest growing old with his grandchildren and now that's about to be taken away. Imagine if Linda, who has had to work very long 
due to some of Alan's other issues, now is facing the reality of, I'm going to have to work long past retirement to support myself, even if he goes. See, in that moment, they're experiencing the reality of that gap, right? Between what they confessed and sang and where they've lived, and now the storm is bringing up to the surface this roaring sound. And God in his mercy says to them, but my decrees are trustworthy and holiness befits my house forevermore. So friend, I don't know what storms, if any, you face, but I do know this. When you face a storm like me, oftentimes there's a gap between what I sing and confess and know to be true in verses one and two and what I'm living out of and struggling to believe in, in verses three and four. What promise from God's book of trustworthy decrees do you need today? I know for me, when we sang, and I need to be reminded of it every week, when we sang Jesus, thank you, the promise of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. These are covenantal words. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities. All of them. How could he say that? Well, the song reminded us, Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. You took upon yourself all of my iniquities so that the judgment do them and the wrath they require for justice to be served and for atonement to be made. You lovingly took them all. So you relate to me not out of judgment or wrath, but through faith in your finished work. I remain your treasured possession. This storm in no way, in no way, indicates or implies unforgiven sins. Otherwise, how do you make sense of the gospel? Thank you, Jesus. Or when the storm clouds my future and I don't know the way ahead, maybe the trustworthy I decree I need is Proverbs 3. It's simple to memorize, but it's hard to apply. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. Is that true? Absolutely. But I need grace to believe it. I need his presence to take that truth and and drive it a little further deeper into the soil of my soul. Because the the storm has weakened my belief that he only knows some of my ways. He doesn't know the way of my boss. He doesn't know the way of my spouse. He doesn't know the way of the church at large or this church. He doesn't know the way of pick your storm. And so I start feeling I need to take control of things. When I am faced with disappointment, which we all are in a broken world. And what I was hoping for, really looking forward to or counting on is taken away. Can I say with Paul? I've known this verse since I was first become a Christian almost 40 years ago. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me, who died for me, who gave himself for me because he loves me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Is Christ my life or is it my life plus that? Plus is great when you're cooking meat. Medium plus, rare plus. Plus gets unsettled in storms when you've added it to Christ. We need God's trustworthy decrees, don't we? And we need his trustworthy 
commands in times of uncertainty. Dave, yesterday as he led us in prayer, and I'll close with this, charged us from 2 Corinthians verses 1 to 5. He didn't know what I was preaching on. Well, he sort of did, right, Dave? But you, you weren't like cheating or whatever, you know, to say, let me find a verse that maps onto the verse. You were just following the Spirit. For as we share, verse 5, abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Here it is. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. God comforts us in all of our afflictions because Christ is keeping covenant with us. His promise is to be with us and his trustworthy decrees given to us. Come to me, all of you who are weary. I will give you rest. Just 10 more minutes on the internet, Lord. There's something I've got to figure out because this is crazy. Take my yoke upon you. Oh, 10 more minutes on Facebook. What did he say? Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble in heart. As I'm cutting the lawn and Linda sees me talking to myself, it's normally I'm not praying to God. I'm not being gentle and humble and hard. I'm prosecuting the person I'm mad at because I'm a lawyer's son. Take my yoke upon you. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your soul. Psalm 93 invites us. The Father in his precious care for us gives us this psalm so that the reality of God's reign expressed through hearing and bringing our soul under the trustworthy decrees revealed in his word will stir our trust and dependence on the spirit that has the ability to create a palpable peace regardless of our circumstances because when the next storm comes, say it with me, verse one, the Lord reigns. Let's pray. Lord, these words, these these words found in your word are living and have the power to secure in our hearts the peace and more importantly, deepen our worship of you in the midst of storms and in days of tranquility. I pray, Lord, you would help us to take this psalm into our day and make it our psalm, to sing this song back to you and to reflect personally about what storms, what trials, what what circumstances, Lord, may have weakened my confidence in your faithfulness and robbed me of the peace of your presence. I pray, Lord, even as we do that, from from that place of rising faith and growing confidence, we can then express back to you and to others what the psalmist led his congregation to do. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. His decrees are trustworthy. Holiness befits your house. Oh, Lord, forevermore. To you be the glory, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen.